will rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the Bible study tonight. We thank you because your presence is here. And with your presence rests your power. I will pray, Lord, that the Bible study will enrich every life in Jesus' name. We we'll pray you grant us understanding. I will pray, Lord, that the spirit that inspired your word will enlighten your people in the study of the word today in Jesus' name. We we'll pray that none of us will just come to the Bible study and go back the same. We we'll pray that the power of the word will work in every life. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight. We're starting a new series and it's in 1 John chapter 1. As you look at uh, the epistle of uh, John to the believers, you'll find that John wrote uh, five books of the New Testament. He wrote the gospel according to St. John. Then he wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then the book of Revelation, making five all together. Every time God used uh, John to write, there was a definite purpose in his mind for writing. As he wrote uh, the gospel according to St. John, he was looking at the past. What Christ has done already. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That's already happened. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That sacrifice already has been made. He that believeth is come out of condemnation and shall not face judgment. But he that believeth not shall be done because of what Jesus did already in the past. Except ye believe in the Son of Man, the Son of God, ye have no life in you. But when you believe, you have eternal life in you. These things have I written that ye may know that ye have eternal life, everlasting life. All that from the gospel according to St. John, that is the past. But then as he writes the epistles from First John, Second John, and Third John, is writing about the present. He that uh, says he knows him and does not keep his commandment is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's about the present. That Jesus Christ already has come to save us. He sacrificed on the cross of Calvary so that you will come to the Lord and be saved. He's talking about the present. Little children flee from idols. He's talking about the present. Then he comes to the revelation. And then he says these are the things that will soon be. The things that you see. The things that you have seen, write everything because these things shall soon come to pass. He's talking about a future. And so as we look at John writing about the past in the gospel, about the present in the epistles and about the future in Revelation. Think about it another way. As you think about John, that is the gospel according to St. John, he's writing about salvation. How do we have salvation? How are we justified? How are we forgiven? How do we have eternal life? All that you find in the gospel, according to St. John, when it comes to the epistles, it's writing about our sanctification. Little children, these things are right unto you that ye see not. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He that believeth in the Son of God overcometh the world. And what is it that overcomes the world? It is our faith by which we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It writes about our sanctification in the Gospels about our salvation. In the epistles, it writes about sanctification. In the revelation, it writes about a glorification. It's talking about, about the church. It says after these things, that is, after the church age, great tribulation will come. And then it comes to the mighty supper of the Lamb in uh, chapter 19 and then chapters 20, 21, 22. It's writing about the far future of the children of God, our destiny, about salvation and about sanctification and about glorification. Now we come to First John chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 1 verse 1. It says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have 
handle of the word of life. It says, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was for the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that she may have fellowship with us, and truly a fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son Jesus Christ. Verse 4 now, these things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. It now comes to the epistle itself, and it tells us particularly the reason why he wrote uh, John, uh, that is, uh, tells us who I wrote uh, this epistle unto the believers. Look at verse 4, it says, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. You understand that the apostle uh, John at this time was more than 90 years of age. He was actually the last apostle to die because all the other apostles had passed on by crucifixion, by being beheaded, by whatever means of persecution. They had all died. But this uh, John, the beloved, that is the apostle whom Je the disciple whom Jesus loved, he was still alive. In his 90s, about 60 years had passed now after the cross, after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was still alive. The Gospels had been reaching, that is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John had been reaching. John to be reaching last. Many of the epistles had been reaching, and now he comes to write to the believers. And he says there's a purpose, and actually reveals the four purposes why he wrote first to John. And the first is, look at that in verse 4 again, these things write we unto you. Why are you writing, John? So that your joy may be full. Number one, it was promote their joy. To promote their joy. There was persecution for the believers. Misunderstanding for the believers. A pressure upon the believers. And it had the tendency of making them sad and making them oppressed and making them feel that uh, why has Christ not come? He says, I'm writing this to you to cheer you up. And to give you joy, to give you happiness, to know that you are following the path that is right, that your joy may be full. That's number one, to promote joy. Number two, it was to prevent sin. That is, he wanted the people to understand if you are born again, a new life has come. If you are born again, you're a child of God. If you are born again, Christ lives within, and Christ is a victorious one. Look at chapter two, verse one. My little children, these things write I unto you that he said not. It says the next purpose I'm writing. As you look at this uh, first epistle of John, I'm writing to you so that it will prevent sin. Temptation will come. Trials will come. And pressures will come upon the mind, upon the flesh, upon the spirit for you to go astray and for you to sin. But I'm writing this to you. If you will read this, if you will study this, if you will believe this, if you will internalize this and apply it to yourself, I write this unto you that ye sin not. Number one, it was to promote joy. Number two, it was to prevent sin. Number three, it was to protect believers. Look at chapter 2 verse 24. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 24. It says, I'm writing for a purpose. Number one, promote your joy. Number two, to prevent sinning. And then number three, it was to, uh, to protect the believers. It says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. These Things have I reaching unto you concerning them that seduce you. It says, I'm writing this to you because I know seducers are there. Tempters and temptresses are there. And false prophets and false teachers are there. The people that would like to sway you. And the people that would like to divert your attention to non-essential areas of life. That you will lose your focus on Christ. It says, I'm writing this to you so that all those seducers, all those tempters, all those detractors will not be able to get your attention. It was to protect the believers. Number four, it was to provide assurance. 
assurance. Provide assurance that in this life you are born again and you can be sure you are born again. In this life you have known the Lord Jesus Christ and you can be sure that you actually know the Lord Jesus Christ that you are actually born again. That you have assurance you are going to heaven. That you can have assurance of your free passage to heaven while you are still here on earth to uh, give them assurance. Look at First John chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 13 here. It says, these things are very rich. You see, every time he tells them, they is a very rich because of that. They is a very rich because of this. They is a very rich because this is the purpose I want to achieve. And in this, verse 13, it says, these things are very rich unto you that believe on the Son of God that ye may know, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God. It says, uh, I'm writing this to you so that you'll have assurance you'll have eternal life. I'm writing this to you so that you'll know your salvation is already done. It's already accomplished. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have that eternal life. Uh, think about that. Again, number one is Robobo Joy, which means that as you study this, if you are a sad Christian, a sorrowful Christian, some things are happening, you can't understand this, you can't understand that. Study the epistle soul of John to the believers and your joy will rise up again. Your joy will be full in Jesus name. Number two is to prevent sin. If you have been a person that is falling and rising, falling and rising as you come to first John, the ace is to give you the victory, the victory of faith and the victory of forgiveness, the victory of freedom, freedom from sin that you will know that Christ has come to live in you and because of the presence of Christ within, because of the prominence of Christ within, because of the power of Christ within because of the uh, preeminence of Christ within you can overcome all the temptations of the devil and you overcome in Jesus name promote your joy and prevent your sinning and also to protect you as a believer because false prophets are flying and in fact Jesus Christ said that by the time he'll be coming near the time of his coming that false prophets will arise they'll even do miraculous things and signs and wonders that if it were possible they will deceive the very elect and because of that kind of deception that is why John has written this so that all the seducers that come they will not overcome you. They will not overcome us. And the church will still be able to stand in that word of God in the faith once delivered forever unto the saints. And then to give you assurance that as we're going on, the devil might say, are you sure you're going to go to heaven? Are you sure that a crisis is coming? Are you sure that uh, you'll make it on the final day? And studying this will actually give you real assurance in your heart. You see, we can be sure of a definite experience of salvation. That you know you are born again. That you know you are a child of God. That Christ lives within. And you can be sure of the experience of sanctification. That the Adamic nature is dealt with. That the root of sin has been dealt with. And that the propensity and the desire and the wanting to sin. That that has been taken away. That the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all sin. And that his prayer for you. That that prayer for sanctify them through the truth. Because the word is true. That that prayer has been answered and by the grace of God within and the godliness of the very root of your experience you can follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see at the Lord. You can have that holiness you'll have it in Jesus name. You can have the assurance that there is heaven. There are some people that doubt is there heaven? Is there no heaven? Of course there is heaven. Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead he appeared to his own disciples 40 days by many infallible proofs and then at the end of that they saw him going to heaven and the heaven received him then were told that when Stephen was about to die he looked up and he saw Jesus when he did see Jesus he saw him in heaven and said Jesus receive my spirit and Paul the apostle had that assurance he said now a crown of righteousness is laid up for me and not for me only but all the people all the people that love his appearance so as they had the assurance you too can have the assurance 
assurance. You have the assurance as you study the word of God and depend upon that word and believe that word. Internalize that word and apply that word to your life. I pray that this assurance will be yours in Jesus' name. We can live victorious from sin and free from sin every day knowing that God's sufficient grace that grants us righteousness through the abiding power of Christ within is there living within us, abiding within us and stronger and stronger every day. That's why John by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has clearly revealed to us that day by day we can have Christ's power within, Christ's presence within, and the Christ's preeminence within, and we live more and more like him, and we rejoice ever more, and we keep ourselves from the pollutions of the world, and we remain steadfast watching and waiting for his return. And I pray that as we come from week to week uh, studying the word of God with us, this victory will be yours in Jesus name. Let's come back to this uh, first John chapter 1. Today we're studying from verses 1 through to 4 and uh, with the title of our study tonight is the foundation of fellowship with God. Foundation of fellowship with God. And as we look at the study we're dividing the study to three parts. Number one beginning before the foundation with God. That is before the foundation there was a beginning, a beginning, a beginning before the foundation of the world and that beginning was with God. And then point number two, the basis of our fellowship with God. The basis of our fellowship with God. And then number three is the benefit of abiding fellowship with God. And let's come back to number one, the beginning before the foundation with God. Here John, the beloved, is writing, he writes in a peculiar way. And uh, you have to compare what he writes in his um, gospel as well as the epistle for you to understand. Let's come to First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. That which was from the beginning. You see, he's talking about something. He said, it's been from the beginning. Uh, you, there's a difference between from the beginning at the beginning, before the beginning, after the beginning. And he writes about everything. He says that, which was from the beginning, which we have heard. He's talking about something that had been from the beginning. And he said, we had that one. Do you know he's talking about a person? And then he goes on to say, which we have seen with our eyes. He says, it's been from the beginning, that which from the beginning we saw with our very eyes, which we have looked upon. He said, it's not just a passing look. It's not just a costly look. We gazed on him and we looked intently at him. We saw him. And then he says, which we have looked upon and our hands have handed he even said we touched him he's saying this is not a phantom this is not his spirit this is for real because we saw him and we heard him not only that we even touched him and we interacted with him and then he calls that uh, individual the word of life it's not just a word and it's not just a life it's the word of life you remember what jesus said when he said i am the way i am the truth and i am the life he's referring to jesus christ yeah? in fact he makes it very clear if you will look at uh, verse uh, three of where we're reading it says that which we have seen still talking about about the same thing and heard declare we unto you that she also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ is explaining now is making it clear now when he said that which we have seen that which we have heard that which we have looked upon and our hands have handled and he called him the word of life he now calls him his son jesus christ i want you to look at uh, chapter uh, chapter one verse seven as he still mentions him, he says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's now identifying, it's now pointing out, it's now helping you to see the one he's talking about when he says, We saw him. We heard him. We looked on him. Our hands touched him and handled him. He called him his son, Jesus Christ. I come to chapter 3, verse 8. Still identifying the person for us. And he says, don't miss this. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 and verse 8. From the middle for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We saw him. 
is Jesus Christ and is the son of God. We handled him. We heard him. The word of victory and the word of liberty and the word that sets us free. That him. And look at chapter 4 and verse 15 referring to Jesus. It says, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God. God dwelleth in him and he in God. It's telling us that when I told you the one we saw, the one we heard, the one we looked upon and, uh, and we gazed on him and even we touched him, he said, I'm talking of no other person but Jesus Christ our Lord and Jesus Christ the son of God. And all through the epistle, he refers to him and identifies him. And look at chapter 5 and verse 20. In chapter 5 verse 20, he still says that's the person I'm talking about and we know that the son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in the in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life let's come back to first John chapter 1 in first John chapter 1 reading verse 1 again beginning before the foundation with God what if I to Jesus Christ it began before the beginning and before the beginning, and before the beginning. Now you understand what that means? Uh, if you identify any point in time, any point as the beginning, it was before that time. Identify another point, it was before that time. Identify that time, again, it was before that time. Which means, it has been from eternity. You cannot really locate a point where he began. Because wherever you locate, whatever point you refer to, he was before that time. Look at this now in chapter 1. It says that we which was from the beginning. That is, as you say, this is the beginning point that history can reckon. He was from that time. It was before that time. That's what the scripture is saying. In effect, it's saying that he was is eternal. He has no beginning. Because any beginning you point to is been there before that time. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And let's come to John. That's the gospel according to St. John. And I'm reading here from verse 1. John chapter 1, we're looking from verse 1, so that you understand what he's saying. He says, in the beginning was the word. Again, he's using the word beginning. In the beginning, the word was already there. Capital W is referring to Jesus Christ. In the beginning, he was already there. Mention another beginning, he was already there. Mention another beginning, he was already there, which means he was before any beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It says, I'm talking about a person, a personality. The word was with God in the beginning. And then it says that word was God. Who are you referring to? Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us, look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 5. Here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And it shows you that he's been there from the very beginning, before the very beginning. It says in John chapter 17 verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thyself with the, glorify me. Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I urge of thee. Tell me the rest there before the world was. You see that? as You think about the beginning of the world. He has been there before the beginning of the world. He says, glorify me or the glory which I had with you before the world was. Look at chapter 17 of John verse 24. In verse 24, see what it tells us here about the glory. It says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I where I was, that they may behold my glory, which thou art given me, for thou hast loved me. Tell me the rest there. 
before the foundation of the world. That is, thou hast not have been there before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was not created. It was before the beginning, before the beginning, before the beginning. Any beginning you can mention is been there all the time. Look at what other parts of the Bible says. Even in Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and telling us that he's been there from before the foundation and he's been in fellowship, in partnership with the Almighty God, with God the Father. Proverbs chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 22. Proverbs chapter 8 from verse 22 The Lord possessed me in the beginning. You know, it's always talking about this beginning. He possessed, I was already there in the beginning. In the beginning of his way, before the, before his works of world, before the creation of the world and before he created the universe, Christ Jesus had been there. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning and uh, it says also or ever the earth was. You see how it uses the word everlasting as well as the beginning. From the beginning, then it says it's from everlasting. When there were no depths I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled. Before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. And when he set a compass upon the face of, of the death, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass, his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, what then I was by him. I was by him. All that time was making, he was creating the world. I was right there as one brought up with him and I was daily his delight rejoicing always before him. And so you understand that he is everlasting. He's been from the beginning. He's been before the beginning. He's always been. That means from the dateless past to the dateless future. It's always there from eternity to eternity, eternity past to eternity future. It's always there from everlasting to everlasting. It's always been there. Micah chapter five, Micah chapter five. And I'm reading here from verse two, Micah chapter five. And we're looking at verse two. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And it says it's been there from all eternity. It's been there from everlasting. And so when it says from before the foundation of the world, from before the beginning of the world, it's talking about the same thing because this Jesus Christ is everlasting forever and ever. It's always been there. Did let's pass on to the deadless future. It's always there. Look at uh, chapter five and I'm reading from verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2. It says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, that though thou be little among the mountains of uh, Judah, uh, yet out of thee shall he come, it's referring to Christ, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. That shows you this is the king, the king of kings and the, and the lord of laws is going to start as the king of the Jews and the ruler of Israel. Then it says, whose goings forth has been from of old, tell me the rest there, from everlasting. That's talking about Jesus Christ. It's been from of old. It's been from everlasting. That is from before the beginning. I was looking at uh, Second Peter now. Second Peter, we're reading from chapter one. Second Peter, we're looking at uh, chapter one. In Second Peter chapter one, I was reading from verse sixteen, telling us about the glory, about the majesty, about the greatness of this uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It says in uh, Second Peter chapter one verse sixteen, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were I, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then it says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mouth. That means he has glory. And that glory has been from everlasting. And then as you come to First John chapter 1 verse 1, it talks about Jesus Christ and it gives a particular title. Look at this, First John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which from the which was from the beginning. Who is he talking about? Tell me out loud. That's Jesus. Which we have heard. Whom did they hear? That's Jesus. They heard him uh, when he gave the sermon on the mount. They heard him when he preached all those things that he preached, reaching in the gospels. Which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes. All the time he healed the sick, they, they saw him. Or when he raised the dead, they saw him. When he cleansed the lepers, they saw him. We saw him with our eyes. And then which we have looked upon. They looked upon him. They gazed on him intently. And our hands have Handle. They edged together. They were in the same boat together. They touched him and he touched them. Our hands are handled. Then he says, of the word of life. Of the word of life. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 19. Of the word of life. The word of life. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 11. Revelation chapter 19 from verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were, or his head were many crowns. And he had a name reaching that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture deed in blood. And his name is called, tell me, his name is called the Word of God. So you see that this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we also read in First John, in John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the Son of God. He became man and lived in our world. The apostles saw, they heard, they touched him. He died for our sins and he was raised again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and he lives there forevermore. He lives in eternity, lives eternally with God in heaven. And one of these days is coming back. And when he comes back, he will take us to himself and we too will live eternally with him in Jesus' name. We come to point number two now. Basis of our fellowship with God. The basis of our fellowship with God. It tells us in verses 2 and 3. First John Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, for the life was manifested. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The life was manifested. And we have seen it. And we and, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. It's talking about manifestation. When you say something is manifested, you make it visible. It wasn't uh, known before. He wasn't visible before. But now, he says he is manifested. What he's referring to is that the prophet spoke about him. When you think about uh, about even Genesis, when it says uh, the, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan, is still coming, not manifested yet. And then when it says the Lord shall provide a lamb himself for the sacrifice, uh, that it wasn't manifested. They were just speaking about him. And when it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's a picture saying that somebody is coming and his blood will be for the redemption, for the forgiveness of the whole earth, the whole world not manifested it. and then when uh, Job even said I see him, I see him, it's my redeemer even though I die and these uh, skin worms destroy my body yet I shall see him myself because it's my redeemer it wasn't physically manifested yet and then he says was led as a lamb to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth because the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes were healed I was talking about him but he was not manifested 
manifested all of a sudden. He appeared the second day. And John saw him coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now is manifested. And they could see. And that's what John, the beloved, was talking about. He was manifested and we saw him. Look at verse 3. Would that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that she also may have fellowship with us and truly a fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ it's talking about Jesus Christ and it talks about his being manifested, his being revealed unto the people and it says that this is the basis of our fellowship with the Lord or the father, we're looking at John chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 3, John chapter 7 we're reading from verse 3 it says that this is the eternal life this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent now that he's manifested now that he was born at Bethlehem now that he's been sacrificed on the cross of Calvary and now that he gave his life his blood for us and he shed that blood for us for our redemption for our forgiveness for our salvation for our justification we can look upon him now and we can take of that blood by faith and say that I'm cleansed, I'm washed, I'm forgiven, my sins are taken away because it's been manifested, his salvation is also manifested unto us and we have eternal life. It tells us in First John, talking about this manifestation, in First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3. And this is what he has come to do for you and for me and for everyone. It tells us the reason for his manifestation and the reason for making him visible. The reason for his coming to this world and the reason for his dying on the cross of Calvary. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whatever sin has been in your life whatever it is, it says Christ was manifested to take away our sin. It's not coming to just make us religious, just make us come to church, just make us read the Bible, just make us, uh, you know, go through the rituals of uh, the, the Christian faith or the Christian church. He has come so that our sins will be taken away. How does he do that? He shed his blood so that our sins will be forgiven. He bore our punishment. He bore our penalty. He took all that judgment and the wrath of God away from us. And now because we are pardoned, he gives us peace with God. And he gives us purity of heart as well. Because it's been manifested, he takes us away from sin. And he takes sin away from us. Look at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. If you have seen of his manifestation. If you have uh, believed in that manifestation, whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. John is very clear. It says there are people that have head knowledge of the manifestation of Christ. Yes, I know. They know the history. I know Jesus came. They can tell you the story. He was born in such and such a place. He lived in such and such a life. He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. They can tell the story. But they have not really believed in the practical way to make them have the experience that Jesus brought to this world. It says, whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. You have have known him there's that partnership you have known him there's that pardon you have known him is taking the punishment you have known him is broken the power of sin away from your life where you abide in him and abide in that faith it says you sin not whosoever sinneth has not seen him and whosoever sinneth has not known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committed sin he that committed sin is of the devil. You know, there are people today, they depend on visions and revelations. And once somebody comes and he can deceive you that I saw Jesus Christ, I saw the Spirit of God come upon me so heavily and so wonderful. The anointing is so heavy and the anointing is here on me. That's all they're looking for. But it says, uh, don't judge by that. Anybody can tell any testimony. Anybody can talk about vision and trance and dream and whatever. It says, this is how you know. If you have the manifestation of the 
son of God. He has been manifested to your life. And you have received him. You have seen him. You have touched him. And he has transformed your life. He says, this is all you know. If you are able to live by his grace, in his strength, by his power, live above sin. He says, yes, you know him. You abide in him. But he that committed sin is of the devil. The thief is of the devil. The adulterer is of the devil. The fornicator is of the devil. The one that is, you know, in the gang and was secret society, all that's of the devil. He that committed sin is of the devil. For this devil sinner from the beginning, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might do what? Tell me out loud. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Sin is the work of the devil. And Jesus Christ was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. If you have not known that victory in your life, I pray that from today you'll know the victory in Jesus' name. He will destroy the works of the devil. And then he tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, is like telling about Jesus Christ, what he came to do. And he needs to do this before he can bring you to fellowship with the Almighty God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 39. In verse 39, it says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up at the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him. After he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he uh, which was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and the dead to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin what's the word remission therefore removal of sin cleansing from sin freedom from sin redemption from sin and that's what he came to do and i pray it will be accomplished in every one of our lives in jesus name because actually if that is not done in our lives of all men will be the most miserable if that is not done in our life saying that we're worshiping god we're coming to bible study we follow after this we follow after all that will be in vain. What Christ has come to do, why it was manifested, is so that it will take sin away from us and bring us into fellowship with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 1 Corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 1, his death was necessary, sacrifice was necessary, so that we'll have pardon from sin, so that we'll have peace with God, so that we'll have purity of heart. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 Moreover, brethren, I declare lay unto you the gospel, the good news which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory. You are saved if you keep in memory. You are saved. You keep saved if you keep in memory. You don't forget what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I pray you will not believe in vain. In verse 3 it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I, re I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And you see that, you know, he died, he was buried, and then he rose again, all for our justification. And then to bring us into fellowship with him. While well, we are referring to all this, let's come back to First John chapter 1. First John Chapter 1, I'm reading now from verses 2 and 3 again. It says, uh, for the life was manifested, Christ was manifested. He is the one that gives us life, life eternal, life everlasting. It says, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was for the Father and was manifested unto us, that, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. 
You're learning this so that you can come into fellowship with the believers. And the Lord himself who has uh, sent Jesus Christ and he makes us partakers of that uh, which he has done. He'll bring us into total fellowship with the Lord, permanent fellowship with the Lord in Jesus name. Then he says that which we have seen, that which we have heard, declare we unto you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. The living cannot have fellowship with the dead. A living God cannot have fellowship with those who are dead in trespasses and in sins. That's why while we were still in our sins, we couldn't have fellowship with him. And Christ came. Christ was manifested so that all that deadness of spirit and soul and mind, everything will be taken away and then we can be brought into live lively fellowship with the Lord. Darkness and light cannot fellowship in any way. All who live in darkness and the darkness of Satan cannot be in fellowship with God. All who are in the darkness of secret society, secret evil, secret wickedness, all those who are still in darkness and have not been redeemed and saved by the power of the blood of the Lamb, they cannot be in fellowship with the living God because God is light and he cannot find fellowship with darkness. But Christ was manifested to be our substitute, our sacrifice, our savior. He came to die for us, to die in our place, to bear the punishment of our sins, thereby removing the death penalty from us. And because death is now gone, darkness is now gone, our doom is also removed. That's why we can come alive. And because of that eternal life, we live in the light. And Christ now brings us into fellowship with the Almighty God and with the Father. Understand, if you're still in darkness, you might be religious, you might uh, you know, be whatever, but uh, you cannot be in fellowship of the Lord when you're still in sin, when you have not been saved. How do we know you are saved? When the sins of the past have all been taken away and you live every moment in the grace of the Lord, you live every moment in holiness and righteousness and godliness. In Psalm 94, Psalm 94, I'm reading here from verse 20. In Psalm 94, verse 20, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? That the answer is no. Those who are still living in iniquity and iniquity dominates them, overcomes them, controls them, directs their lives. They cannot be in fellowship with God. Those who have not been saved from their iniquity, not just to say I'm saved, I'm saved. Many people say that I'm born again, I'm born again. Many people say that. But it is when you are totally free from that sin and the manifestation of Christ has been made effective in your life. That's how you have fellowship with the Lord. Darkness and light cannot have fellowship. And the death and life cannot have fellowship. Oil and water do not mix. And you cannot have fellowship with God until you're actually born again. We're told in Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? God is righteous. And you are righteous until you are born again. You are unrighteous until you have eternal life. You are righteous until you have Jesus Christ living and abiding in you. If you are still unrighteous, you are not in a fellowship with the righteous God of heaven. Stealing is there. Adultery is there. Fornication is there. I don't worship is there and uh, you know fighting is there. All those evil things are there. Lying and cheating. All those things are there. It says uh, for the for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness. What communion has light with darkness? There's no communion. There's no fellowship. There's no unity. There's no understanding between light and darkness. And what concord has Christ with Belial? That is if you have anything still to do with Satan, satanic worship or satanic uh, veneration or you know rituals and covenants with all those satanic uh, entities or uh, personalities you have no fellowship with Christ and it says what part has he that believeth with an infidel if you are an infidel at heart no fear of God at heart and you live a life that shows that you are like an infidel you do not uh, reckon with God there is no God in your thought then you cannot have fellowship with God what agreement has the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of 
of the living God. As God has said, I will walk in them. I will dwell in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. If we're going to have fellowship with God, see what it says in verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. Come out from among them. There has to be repentance, separation from sin, separation from evil. Before you can come into fellowship with the Lord, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. Taste not the unclean thing. Partake not of the unclean thing. Your life is totally separated from that which is unclean, that which is unrighteous, that which is ungodly. Only then can you profess to be born again. If you are if your life is not free from all that ungodliness and all that evil, it means you are not born again yet and you cannot be in fellowship with the Lord. That what you have seen and that what you have handled, that will declare to you that she may have fellowship with God with us. And not only that, a truly a fellowship is with the Father and with, with, with the Son. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And to keep in that fellowship, we have to keep on walking in the light and living in the light and abiding in the light. We're looking at First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 5. It says, this then is the message we have heard we, that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is is no darkness at all. He'll not have fellowship with darkness. Anyone in darkness? No, not in any way. In verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say we have fellowship with God, righteous God, and we, we live in unrighteousness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say we have fellowship with God, God is holy, and we are unholy, unholy in heart, unholy in tongue, unholy in language, unholy in lifestyle, we lie and do not the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him, God, who is uh, almighty and powerful and peaceful, and there's no peace in our heart, and there's no peace with other people, it's all going and fighting, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ's son cleanseth us from tell me from all sin. Chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 24. 1 John chapter 2 verse 24 it says let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning if that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you ye also shall continue in the son and in the father. It means that everything you had before you were born again let it abide in you. You heard we shall repent. Turn away from sin and live righteously. You turned away from your sin. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Abide in that. You heard that we shall forsake all those evil covenants you made when you were in the world. Abide in that. You've done that before you could be born again and you have heard that you come out of them among, among those evil doers and those sin partners of the past. Now if you've done that before you were born again, now that you are born again, abide in what you have heard. You have heard that he that loveth the world will not abide forever. And then you came out of the world because, uh, you know, if any man lost the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Don't you know, ye adulterers and adulteresses of the love of the world is uh, enmity with God. Therefore, you came out. Abide in that. Don't slide back again and go back again into the evil that you led before. It says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. It tells us in verse 28, verse 28, and now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we also may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. We need to continue in what we have learned and what we have believed and how he wants us to live if we are going to uh, remain in fellowship with the Lord. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 
Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. It's telling us that, uh, you know, after you are born again, if you hold fast, you remain saved. If you keep on looking unto Jesus, you remain saved. If you keep on in righteousness that Christ has given when you are born again, you remain saved. But if you look away from him, if you turn away from him, that will mean that you will not continue in his fellowship again. Because it says Christ has a son over his house, his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast? The very confidence and rejoicing of the hope from today. Look at verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That life, that commitment you made at the beginning, that consecration you made at the beginning, that commitment you made to the Lord at the beginning, you hold fast even until the final time. And as you do that, we remain in fellowship with the Lord in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verses 20 and 21. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. It tells us in verse 20, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that she have fellowship with devils. When you partake of their sacrifices, when you partake of their festivals, when you have joy in their masquerades, and when you do all those things, it says, uh, you are fellowship with the devil. And if you cannot fellowship with the devil and fellowship with God at the same time, it says, I'm telling you that those things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they're sacrificing to devils. If you eat of that, if you partake of that, if you take joy in that, if you do their festivities with them, you are fellowshipping with the devil. And I would not that you should have fellowship with the devil. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. In fellowship with God, we have been forgiven and set free from sin. We're now members of his family. We have given him our hearts, our desires, and our delight. He has given us grace. He has given us mercy. He has given us love. We love him. We love his word. We love his way. We love his will. We love God as our father. And we love Christ as our Savior and Lord and Master. We love the Holy Spirit as our comforter, as our teacher, and as our guide. We love what God loves. We hate what God hates. We hate idols. We hate Satan. We hate idol worship. We flee from them. We are in true fellowship with God now, and we shall be in transcendent fellowship with Him eternally in heaven as we hold fast unto the very end. I pray that you hold on fast unto the very end in Jesus name we come now to the last part of the study that's to the benefits of abiding fellowship with God we're looking at first John chapter 1 verse 4 first John chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 4 and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full it says these things right we unto you that your joy may be full uh, when he says these things what does that mean it's actually writing about uh, the whole scene now of the epistle it's not just writing about uh, verses one to three it's not saying i've told you this because all verses one and three will just be this will be singular it's writing about jesus christ as the word of life as the word of god is writing about his manifestation but then he goes on in the rest of the epistle and it says all these things that i'm going to write i'm writing to you concerning the savior and concerning our salvation i'm writing to you concerning freedom from sin i'm writing to you concerning fellowship with god i'm writing to you concerning walking in the light i'm writing to you concerning not loving the world i'm writing to, to, to you concerning peace with god and purity of life i'm writing to you concerning inward righteousness and practical holiness i'm writing these things unto you why that your joy may be full. It says, read this, that your joy may be full. Study this, that your joy may be full. 
believe this, that your joy may be for living the knowledge of these things, so that you'll be truly happy and eternally joyful. There's fullness of joy. Look at that verse 4 again. This thing's right well unto you, that your joy may be full. When he talks about a fullness of joy, actually, there are, the, the Bible describes a joy in uh, various ways. Uh, the reason for the joy and the, the reason why you are joyful. Uh, you know, one of our uh, songs, uh, crosses, say, tell me what's a joy if you don't have Jesus. Tell me what's a joy if you are not born again. Tell me what's a joy if you're still a child of the devil. Tell me what's a joy if you don't have assurance of going to heaven. How do we have, what's the reason for our joy? What's the basis for our joy? And what's the benefit of actually having fellowship with God? And look at uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading here from verse 12. Psalm 51 verse 12, Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. The first reason why we have joy is that we're saved. We're born again. Our names are written in the book of life in heaven. The joy of salvation. Come to Jeremiah chapter 15 and I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 16 and see what brings joy to the believer. Chapter 15 verse 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. It says I I found your word. I found your word. The word of promise, I found it. The word of power, I found it. The word of peace with God, I found it. And the word of my pardon, I found the word that prepares me for eternity. I found that. And it says, your word has been my joy and the rejoicing of my heart because I am called by thy name, O Lord God. God of hosts. Number one is the joy of salvation. Number two is the joy of scripture. The joy of scripture. When you read the word, you believe the word. The Lord ministers to you in the word, saturated by the word, you have joy. It tells us in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 34 all through to verse 36. The reason why we have joy in the Lord. Joy of salvation number one, joy of scripture number two. And John chapter 4 verse 34, it says, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. It say not ye that are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that repaired receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Both he that soweth and reapeth shall rejoice together. It's talking of the joy of soul winning. When you go out and then you reap harvest into a kingdom, you reap those that are seeking soul, they're seeking salvation, they're seeking the Savior, and you bring them to the Lord. What joy you have. Number one is the joy of salvation. Number two is the joy of scripture. Number three is the joy in soul winning. Winning. Number four now, we're looking at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse uh, from verse 20. Luke chapter 10, we're reading from verse 20. Here the 70 had been sent out, and they came back, and they came back with uh, testimonies because a lot of people had come to the Lord. Chapter uh, 10, let me read from verse 17. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. That's the joy of service. When you're serving the Lord, he sent you out, and uh, obedient to the heavenly vision, you bring many souls into the kingdom, and the sick are healed, and the demonized are delivered, and you see that he's blessing the service that are rendering to the Lord the joy of service. Look, go to verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. You're still born again. Not only service, but salvation must be preserved. And you know you are going to heaven. Verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father. 
The Lord, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. That's joy like the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ rejoiced because these things uh, were revealed unto babes, and uh, it was hidden from the hand from the people that they didn't actually have a relish or desire or the life liking uh, for the things uh, of God. We're looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 13. In verse 13, it says, But rejoice, but rejoice, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering." Think about that. You are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. It's the joy in suffering. Joy in suffering. Suffering for Christ. Suffering persecution. That you are counted to be a partaker of Christ's suffering. Then we come to Revelation chapter 19. That's a final joy. At the marriage supper of the Lamb. Joy at the last supper. Joy at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That you are counted worthy to be among the people that will go or to uh, the great beyond. When Christ shall come. When the saints go marching in. That she will be among them. I'll be there. I said I'll be there. It says Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. I pray you'll be ready in Jesus name. You need to get saved to be ready. You need to be living the victorious life to be ready. Because you see the foolish virgins will not be ready. Uh, even though they say they are waiting for the Lord but there is no light and there is no oil in their vessels but when you trim your lamp and your light is shining let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then they glorify your father who is in heaven your life is righteous your life is holy you are saved you are sanctified you are following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord you have clean hands and you have a pure heart he that has this open he purifies himself even as Christ is pure when that pardon is there when that peace is there when that purity is there when that holiness is there and then you're expecting the coming of the Lord I pray that you'll be ready in Jesus name it says if you're like that saved and sanctified a wise virgin it says let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor and glory to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and then it says his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrested Read in fine linen, clean and white. No spoil, no spoils on your uh, spiritual garment. No stain on your spiritual garment. There's no stain on your Christian life. There's no blemish in your Christian life. It says it's pure and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints is going to take that righteousness before we meet the Lord on that final day of the rapture. And he said unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, he saith unto me, these are the true saints of God. I pray you'll be there on that final day in Jesus' name. Uh, John, the apostle, is telling us these things. Uh, write we unto you that your joy may be full. What's the fullness of joy? It begins with the joy of salvation. And then the joy of scripture, saturation with scripture, and the joy in soul winning, the joy in service, the joy like the Savior, the joy in suffering and sanctification, the joy at his supper. There is no lasting joy without salvation. There's no lasting joy without forgiveness and freedom. There's no lasting joy without totally being separated from sin and sin separated from you. There's no lasting joy, abiding joy without intimate fellowship of the living God. There can be no lasting joy except you know the assurance is there that should you die at this time, you will not go to hell, you will go to heaven. If there's any conflict in your heart, any confusion in your heart, any condemnation in your heart, any guilt in your heart that should death come 
come at this time, where will you spend eternity? You cannot be joyful if you sleep at night. The body is there, the body of guilt and the body of what you have done. What if something happened and they discovered I'm, I'm just a secret sinner? What if something happened and they discovered that you have had days and days that's not according to the word of God? What if something happened and then they just saw that I've been a big hypocrite all my life? There'll be no joy, but when your heart is free, when your mind is free, when you are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, when all the is that the apostle is writing about that he has shown you the savior you have the savior you have the salvation you have eternal life and you have the life that is transparent before the lord and transparent before people around you and you can say praise the lord i know that you're the trumpet son of the dead in christ rise and then we're caught up together to be with him i know i shall be there i will be there i know that what the apostle is writing about is real in my life is practical in my life that's the only time you can have the joy we're speaking about. That's why you say that don't just come in vain to the Bible study, read it and apply it and believe it and, and make sure you internalize it so that all these can be part of your life and then your joy will be full in Jesus' name. Joy of salvation, joy of sanctification, joy of service and joy of spirituality. If you only know, G, if you only know Jesus as the judge of the earth and not your savior, if you only know God as the judge of all the earth and not your father, if you only know the Holy Spirit and one that brings conviction and not comfort, there will be no joy. But when you move on and say I know Jesus is my savior. I know the, I know God is my father. I know the Holy Spirit is the power that uh, kind of uh, walketh within me and makes me to live the righteous life then your joy will know no bounds. In the day there will be joy. In the night there will be joy. Whatever is happening there will be joy. J-O-Y Jesus and you you with nothing in between. If there's something in between, it will block that joy. But Jesus and you, without anything between, that you have the fullness of joy, salvation, scripture, service, soul winning, sanctification, suffering joyfully and happily, and then at the might supper of the Lamb, eventually joy. I pray that the Lord will effect it in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. I'm looking at um, Jude verses 24 and 25. Jude verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. He'll keep you from falling. You may fall into sin, fall into adultery, fall into fornication, fall into idol worship, fall into, you know, whatever. Every time you're saved, you have eternal life, you live a clean life, you have a transparent life, life for, that shows that Christ has been manifested unto you now, unto him, that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with what kind of joy? Exceeding joy, exceeding joy, everlasting joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and ever. And everybody said, Amen. The Lord will accomplish it in every one of our lives. In Jesus' name. In John, he wants us to continue in that fellowship, in that relationship, so that that joy will continue every time, everywhere, depend on the power of the Lord, on the strength of the Lord, and let his presence bring that joy every time. John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 1. John chapter 15, reading from verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You can't have joy when you're not bearing fruit because it takes you away. The fellowship with the Lord will not be there. But every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purges that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word is supposed to make us clean and keep us clean. Make us pure. Keep us pure. Make us holy and keep us holy. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot be a fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I, I, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. I pray you'll be a fruit.
That's what brings joy. You're serving the Lord. You're following up on those who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and you're bringing them into the kingdom. You abide in him and then you are bearing much fruit for without me you can do nothing if a man abides not in me. He is passed forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burnt. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and shall be done unto you. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, the words you hear, the Bible study, you, the words you hear during the worship service on Sunday, the words you hear, every time you hear the preaching of the word, if you allow that to abide in you, so that when challenges come during the day, challenges come during the week, you apply that word to your sail to your heart. Well, I must walk this way of righteousness, this way of holiness because that's the word I learned when I went to the Bible study. If if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, much fruit. So ye shall be my disciples as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my command and means you shall abide in my law. That's how fellowship will remain. You keep the commandments of the Lord. You keep the words of the Lord. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. And that your joy might be full. Your joy will be full. With salvation in your heart, your joy will be full. With sanctification experience, your joy will be full. And with your soul winning and doing the work of the Lord and you have the presence of every time, your joy will be full in Jesus' name. With the Lord walking with you and preparing you for that coming glory when the Lord shall come. And then you'll take the saints when you know that you are going to be part of them and you have that assurance of eternal life. Why would your joy not be full? Obey the word of God and keep in fellowship with the Lord that your joy may be full. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord, thank the Lord for what he has done and what he has taught us in the world today. Thank the Lord that we know him more because he's Jesus Christ, the eternal one. He was from the beginning. From before the beginning, from all eternity, and from everlasting, he has been there. And now he was manifested unto us on the cross of Calvary. He died for us so as to take our sins away. Has he taken your sins away? Are you born again? Are you a child of God? If you have not been born again, come out from among them. Repent. Turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I want your salvation. I want eternal life. He will do it for you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And after you are saved, that's not the end. He wants you to live a holy life, a righteous life, a godly life. No guilt, no condemnation, no secret sin, nothing evil. You are living a transparent life before the Lord and before your neighbors. Joy will be in your heart, the joy of salvation. You are reading the scriptures, supplying the scriptures to your life. It will be the joy of saturation with scripture. You are reaching out to the people around you, bringing them to the kingdom of God, and they are actually being born again. And they are remaining, instead, they are remaining steadfast in the Lord. It will be the joy of soul winning. You are serving the Lord, and the Lord is prospering the work in your hand. Souls being saved, souls being sanctified, being prepared for heaven. There will be the joy of service. You see, the word of God has been revealed to converts, new babes in Christ. There will be the joy like that of the Savior. He cleanses your heart, purifies your heart, purges your heart, makes you holy within and without. There will be joy in sanctification. You're looking forward to the time when it will come. When the saints are gathered unto him on the final day. And the Spirit of God assures you, you are one of the wise virgins getting ready for his return. You'll have the joy at that great supper of the Lamb. Saved, sanctified, serving the Lord, suffering persecution, if need be, joyfully.
Then you know you'll meet with the Lord on the final day with all the saints.